Hi, Scott and Monique. Good morning. How are you? Doing fine, how are you? Good. Good morning. Good morning. So we'll, we'll just get you set up. Um, your, everything is all set up to be able to share your screen. So um, we have uh, Tom Esselman will be fa facilitating the meeting today. And um, we'll just be able, yeah. So it looks like you got screen sharing all good to go. And um, so there we have it. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for being here today, appreciate oh, you. Not a problem. Um, could you share with me a little bit of the context on um, whom we're addressing and, and um, who will be involved? Yeah, so um, this is the um, Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion. So there's a wide variety of organizations here. Um, sometimes there's a few um, internet service providers as well. And um, I'm trying to think if we have anyone from schools who join us regularly. Um, sometimes they pop in. Um, and so it's, it's generally, um, you know, community-based organizations that have, and, and the library um, that has some um, interest in, in digital inclusion work. And there's Tom Esselman right there. Thank you. I think Sean, um, you're the only one he doesn't, he doesn't know. So um, I think Tom is, oh my gosh. <laughs> What a get up you have on, sir. Well, you know, I'm from Louisville and tomorrow's Derby Day. And at one o'clock this afternoon, our team is having, we're closing down early and we're having a big team celebration and it's all themed. It's all Kentucky Derby theme. Oh my gosh. So uh, I won't leave this on during the whole meeting, but I had to at least let you know, I do take my Kentucky Derby festivities quite seriously wow well that is just really remarkable <laughs> i feel stuff. i've let my i feel i've let my alma mater down um i went to uofl uh, for undergraduate oh how about that yeah but uh i wasn't even it didn't even register to me that tomorrow is derby day <laughs> yeah it and it's one of those things that's uh literally unless you're in the the greater Louisville or Southern Indiana area. It's kind of easy to, <laughs> for that, especially the past couple of years with COVID. Um, yeah. But this, they're excited. I mean, it's going to be really sloppy race, but um, it's such a grand tradition. And, um, <laughs> you know, my mom still lives there. My two older brothers are there. Uh, I have all kinds of friends that make a big deal and they post all their pictures on social media. Uh, so. Anyway, we we have fun with it. Well, I think we okay. have screen sharing all all enabled for everyone. Um, I don't know, Sean, if you want to test out your sure. um, your file, you should be good to go though. I'm I'll gonna... just do this to so That's you're seeing well. my screen. There you go. Yeah. All right. And then Tom, on the order on the agenda. Um, is Sean, Sean's going first, right? Yes, although Monique mentioned she's going to have to leave. So I don't know how long, Monique, you're able to, to stay on. But we do have yes. Sean going first and then and then Monique and Scott and Lazone. Sure. So I'm um, sorry, Tom, we should have laid it out for you. It will be Sean and then Lazone, Scott, and I'll be last. And then oh. when I'm finished, I'll just leave at, at that point. Great. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to check my ability to share too. Oh yeah, because I've got the slides. And did you just update the order then of the presenters? Uh, let me see. I will do that. Because I I don't know that I can rely on my memory to be honest. I chose the wrong tab. Hold on. <laughs> 
Okay, where's the agenda? There it is. So Sean goes first, and then I will put, is it Lazone first, and then Scott, and then Monique? Yep. Okay. And Lazone, I never asked you, and I looked on your website and can't find what the acronym IBSA stands for. I don't think he's here yet. Oh, okay, he's not. Do you know, Scott or Monique, what IBSA stands for? I do not. I thought it was International Students of Black Alliance, but I'm not quite sure. International Black Student Alliance, that there makes sense. Yeah, I think yeah. that's what it is. Yep, yeah. okay, but that makes sense. Good. All right, now I'm going to screen share that slide and see if you guys think it looks okay. Where am I? No, is that? Okay, are you seeing that? I'm seeing the agenda, yes. And the agenda. The, yes, uh, G-O-W-A-N is my last oh, name. Oh, I, I knew that, Scott. You're fine, Sorry you're about fine. that. <laughs> I worked for years with a Matt Gallon at Hallmark. <laughs> and I spelled it the same way. Uh, okay, there you go. Got that. Thank you, thank you. All right. And then I'll go back to this. We have an extra comma after Monique's um, title. Oh, hold on. Oh, you're right. And then yeah. there's an and and stuff. Yeah. So just like after after her title. There it there, is. There, just get rid yeah. of like that comma through that and. Yep. Yep. There we go. Okay, very good. Okay. Does that look all right? I think so. I think we're good. Thank you for doing that. I just don't know how long I can stand seeing myself with this hat on, <laughs> much less anyone else. <laughs> but that's okay. I've committed to doing it, at least to start the meeting out this way. It looks. I great. think it's just the whole package you got going on there. With <laughs> the, the, the KC reference, yeah. The, the t-shirt and the kind of Miami Vice looking sort of jacket you got on today? Uh, I, I actually had a, a traditional seersucker jacket, but lo and behold, my son has apparently <laughs> borrowed it and not returned it to me, so. Well, it's a whole look. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh. I think I'll check in with Lazone and make sure that he's got everything he needs.
Tom, is your horse out front? <laughs> hey, Ina. <laughs> we're ha- I, I don't know if you just got on. We're having a derby theme party at our warehouse uh, oh, okay. this, this afternoon. So this was the best I could do. Uh, <laughs> since I'm from Louisville, so I take my Kentucky Derby festivities seriously. Pretty serious. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. And I guarantee you we have a, a good number of people who are will still be wearing their Cinco de Mayo hats from yesterday. And I told them that was that was allowed. That was fair, you know. <laughs> so you're believing that they're actually um, horizontal. I'm sorry, vertical. From single to mile oh, yesterday. Oh no, yeah. Whoever manages to show up, that was partying yesterday. Actually, we don't we don't have too many people. We have a lot of um, our staff are actually from Mexico, and they said mm-hmm. it's a lot bigger celebration in America than it is in Mexico. Um, um, they said it's like the equivalent of like celebrating the Battle of Gettysburg or something in in America. Mm-hmm. It's not that big of a deal, uh, but. Boy, the Americans sure use it as a an excuse to party. So I was just going to say, any reason to drink? I'm telling you, crazy. And I live just behind Southwest Boulevard uh, in uh, on the west mm-hmm. side in Kansas City, mm-hmm. and it was pr- a pretty crazy night. Yeah, it's pretty quiet in KCK, where everybody understands the holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good morning. And Liz hey, uh, joined us. I don't know if everybody noticed that, but yeah. so um there he is. Hi Lazone. Hey, Lizone. Good morning, Lizone. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's well on this good Friday. We're doing great. Hello, Ms. Brown, long time no see. Hello, it's good to see you as well. Look forward to your uh, presentation today. All right, well, thanks. Everybody ready for summer to be here next week? I've been looking outside for Noah's Ark uh, <laughs> to show up. Uh, but 95, we went from 50s to 95. What the yeah. heck? Yeah, it's going to be quite I muggy know, next I'm week. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. I'm tired of wearing my coat in, in, in May. I'm ready, but I'm taking, on, I'm taking bets on how long it'll last. Yeah. Fake summer. Is that what's gonna happen? <laughs> I guess. I'm I'm ready for warmer, but I don't know if I'm ready to go from <laughs> 60 to 95 like overnight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, Leslie. Um. As I get older, the heat just, I don't, I can't handle it. Especially if I don't have any warning and can't work up to it. Well, uh, let me just send a welcome out to everyone that's on the call so far. And uh, we'll just give it a minute or two more to allow other people to get get on the call before we get started. Okay. Okay. 
Right. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and get us started, and we'll just uh, hopefully welcome others as they join us, because um, I want to make sure that we um, allow for the time we committed for our speakers. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Esselman. I'm the executive director for PCs for People in Kansas City uh, and celebrating a day early, the Kentucky Derby. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky is my hometown. Uh, and my team is going to be participating in a derby theme party this afternoon. So um, I just wanted to make sure I, I got the party started early. And uh, uh, I just want to welcome everybody to this month's meeting. Uh, we've got um, some really great topics to share. And I'm going to uh, start out by just reminding everybody about the, the coalition. Uh, we have been operating as a volunteer-based coalition since 2015. Uh, our mission and vision are listed here. And we, uh, we continue to welcome new attendees each month. Um, the organization of the uh, coalition has been done by a steering council uh, that includes myself and, and Carrie and Aaron and Ina. Uh, Rick Usher, who was previously with the city of Kansas City, Missouri, has been uh, continuing to assist us as well as he now plays a, a, a consult professional consulting role uh, in his new career, his encore career. Uh, and so um, uh, I also want to welcome uh, anyone who is not currently enrolled as a member to do so uh, by visiting our website, digitalinclusionkc.org. Uh, with the backslash join so you can fill out. It's a free membership, but I think it makes uh, a big difference when coalitions and advocacy, advocacy work is done around the country and, and we can show a strong membership in the coalition. Um, so um, uh, the last thing, as a reminder, I just want to make sure that you all can stay connected with us through all our various websites, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube channels. So without any further ado, uh, I wanna make sure that everyone knows what our agenda is today. Um, and, uh, and, and before we start into the speaking, I just wanna uh, make sure to call out what we're gonna be talking about, who's gonna be speaking, and allow for anyone who is joining this meeting for the first time to just make a quick hello. So first of all, let me just review the agenda. We'll have a, a quick member update from the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I think Maricela uh, Garcia is gonna be doing the speaking, but Pedro and Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Fumero are, are gonna be on with us as well. And then we've got uh, our feature presentation, which is gonna begin with Sean Brown from the Kansas Health Foundation. Uh, and then we'll hear from Lazone Grays and Scott Gowan and uh, Monique Glaude from Topeka with really a, an incredible groundbreaking initiative that to be fair has been something that's been worked on for 10 or 15 years, if not more uh, by Lazone. And when I, uh, when I introduce that group a little bit later, I'll give you a little bit more uh, background. But before we get started, just anyone else on the call for the first time who would like to just introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Nate Madden. Um, I'm with the Health Forward Foundation uh, doing their policy, uh, on their policy team working with uh, McLean. Um, <clears throat> and this is my first meeting. I, I just joined uh, at the very end of March. So I'm really happy to uh, uh, get a chance to you know, learn more about this um, and and see where I and we as an organization can help uh, advance um, uh, the work that that the coalition is doing. Excellent, welcome, Nate. And uh, I know with the recent update to the Health Forward Foundation strategic plan, uh, digital equity and broadband access, everything that we work on here in the coalition is. Um, is a is fully acknowledged and and prioritized so um it, it makes sense and I'm, I'm thrilled to have you as part of the group welcome anyone else joining for the first time all right then well we've got um like i said a really exciting 
um, you know, set of topics. Uh, but before we get into our main presentation, I just want to give the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation a chance to do a brief introduction uh, as, as what we refer to in this section as a member update. Um, so, uh, so Pedro or uh, Gabriel or Maricela, whichever one of you would like to provide uh, a nice overview and some highlights of the work going on at the ATDC. I'm, I'm actually not sure anyone from HEDC is on at the moment. Oh, well, there you go. I was expecting Maricela. So if she joins us later, we'll give, give her an opportunity at the, at the tail end uh, and no problem. So um, I do know that, that the HEDC has had a presence in the coalition since its very beginning, back in 2015. Uh, Gabrielle in particular attends every meeting uh, and I know they've got um, a big set of activities going on today. Um, so um, that's why he said he might be on for just a very short time. So we'll come back to them. So why don't we move on to our presentation then to allow our speakers to um, share some very exciting news. Uh, and I wanna start out by introducing Sean Brown, who's the program officer at the Kansas Health Foundation. Uh, and uh, she will talk about how the foundation has uh, become engaged in digital inclusion uh, and how its digital equity fund uh, has created a, a collaborative grant program uh, that's really been a boost uh, for the work we're gonna hear about from Topeka. So Sean, let me hand it over to you and you can share your screen. All right, thank you, Tom. All right, is everyone seeing my screen? Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today about the Kansas Digital Equity and Inclusion Collaborative. Um, I'm Sean Brown, Program Officer, um, as Tom mentioned, with the Kansas Health Foundation, and I'm part of a team that um, works with um, uh, creating uh, strategies and engaging the community and developing partnerships to improve the health of all Kansans. And this initiative is one example um, where we are seeking to implement strategies. And so I'll provide an overview of the collaborative, talk a little bit about um, why we initiated it and um, provide you some of the program design, talk about the project goals and partner support. And bear with me one second. Um, let me. It is not advancing. Give me one second here. For some reason, my slides are not advancing. Hmm. Bear with me. I do not know why they are not. You can try going out and coming back in, maybe. Yeah, let me try stop sharing. And I'll share again. I just, this is weird. My... I am so sorry, my slideshows are not showing up. I mean, you it's stuck on the, and no matter what I'm doing, I'm clicking my bottom screen. I'm, I started from the beginning. I've got my slideshow going. Do you wanna send it, the file to me, Sean, and see if yeah. I can do it? Yeah, let me do that real quick. If you want to just stop sharing, let me see if I can bring it up. Okay. Hold on a second. I have a new computer and it is just not cooperating. I am so sorry. Yeah. 
There we go. As a CIO, I will say that technology challenges happen to the best of us. Do not worry. <laughs> Are you able to bring it up, Leslie? Yeah, let me see if I can get it shared here. This is totally weird, I must say. All right, there we go. All right, good job, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so um, as I was saying, we are um, we have started the program um, to uh, essentially address digital literacy and and equity. And if you could go to the next slide, please. So why focus on digital um, equity and literacy? And so for us, one of the reasons was it's a matter of moving from um, uh, awareness to will to action. And so um, particularly for us, we've been known for our policy systems and environmental change work around health. And um, we are newer to the digital um, equity arena. And so for us, it was a matter, as I said, from moving from awareness to will to action. And I'll go into that a little bit more um, in the next couple of slides. But the other reason is that um, broadband uh, is essential infrastructure and the lack of access is a significant equity issue that has to be addressed um, because of its wide ranging applications that really touch on every determinant of social um, uh, health. And so, you know, whether that's economic stability, whether that's um, social supports or civic agency, um, broadband and the digital services that it enables um, really are intrinsically tied to collective health and equity outcomes. And so when we talk about, and if you can go to the next slide, please. When we talk about achieving health equity, which we define as the highest levels of health for, for all people, we know that it requires um, addressing health disparities related to social and economic factors. Um, we know that it requires looking at the social determinants of health, as I mentioned, and then asking critical questions in terms of the historical and structural um, decisions contributing to the conditions to be addressed. Um, and for example, why is there a 20 year gap in terms of life expectancy uh, when it comes to red line communities and what can we do about it? And next slide, please. So um, with this graphic, um, you know, you may be wondering, well, how is it that certain issues uh, such as digital equity and inclusion rise to, to the top for funders and at various stages? And, you know, what are some of those drivers? And so I want to take a moment just to highlight um, this graphic from Innovation Network, which really demonstrates how these strategies and tactics can influence um, uh, the public. And so, you know, at the bottom of the, the graphic, you can see that there are um, three audiences, public, the public, influencers, and decision makers. And, um, and then to the left, you can see how, we, you know, we want to move these um, audiences from awareness to will to action. Um, and so, you know, in some cases, there may be public education that's occurring, as you can see, um, highlighted by the, the green ovals at the bottom or influencer education or um, policymaker education. Uh, you may be um, operating pilot programs as you kind of move up the spectrum in terms of awareness. And then when you think of the, the turquoise areas, um, you may be um, putting together, <clears throat> excuse me, you may be putting together like media um, and advocacy uh, and communication campaigns and political campaigns and um, uh, political awareness campaigns as well. And then as you move further up the spectrum, um, you can see that there's coalition building, um, there's community mobilizing, and there's lobbying that's occurring potentially around an issue. And sometimes, um, you know, these uh, campaigns move in a very fluid and natural way, for example, you know, with the murder of George Floyd, we saw people move right away from awareness to will to action. Um, and in, in the case of digital equity, with people being at home and needing to use 
uh, the internet and working remotely, again, people's awareness was heightened. Um, and particularly for funders, um, as we look at what's happening, not only locally, but um, in other parts of the country, uh, it becomes important to kind of keep uh, uh, abreast of the trends. And so that's another reason um, in terms of why funders may move in a direction and support an issue. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of what determines health, um, we know that uh, you're likely familiar with this graphic or one that's similar to it. Um, and we know that 20% of health um, is related or can be attributed to healthcare. The other 20% is genetics. Uh, and then there's a full 60% um, that's related to the social, environmental, and behavioral factors. And so, um, you know, and, and commonly the indicators for, for social economic status are income, wealth, and education. And we believe that broadband can really touch upon all of those. Next slide, please. So how can we impact health disparities? And for us, in terms of impacting disparities, it's been important to, to move upstream and to really focus on community conditions. For example, someone may have a heart attack. Well, um, we need to be asking ourselves, what were the community conditions that could have contributed to that? You know, um, was it lack of a healthy diet or a high fat diet? Were there not places in the neighborhood for walking or exercise um, or stress from lack of finances? So really looking at, you know, what are those upstream um, factors that are having an impact? Because we know um, at the lower level, of course, there are medical interventions and, and we're grateful and thankful for those. Um, but if we really want to um, see the greatest impact, we need to be thinking about how we can move upstream. Next slide, please. So in, in terms of um, growing communities um, and, and again, thinking about those social determinants of health, um, this is a policy link slide, which I like to use to illustrate what we intuitively know, which is uh, when inequities are high and community assets are low, um, health outcomes tend to be worse. Uh, when inequities are low and community assets are high, then health outcomes tend to be better. So if you look at the tree on the right, um, it represents those uh, communities of opportunity where there are quality schools and access to health care and, and there's good housing and there's um, job support and growth. Um, and it's not that um, when you have these uh, neighborhoods that are more so flourishing that they aren't impacted by you know, whether that's depression or infant mortality or violence, but it's, it's that they're being supported with networks and they're being supported um, in terms of, you know, people being able to have influence in the neighborhood and move certain policies forward. And again, I think that um, digital literacy and access play a, play a role in that. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, addressing racial equity and health disparities, um, Kansas Health Foundation is really working to put uh, equity at the heart of our work. And we're doing that this year in terms of uh, looking at ways to um, particularly support um, those communities that have historically been redlined. Um, also um, organizing um, and working with uh, communities of color um, and organizations led by communities of color and thinking about ways that we can move um, equitable policies forward. And then of course, civic and community engagement. Next slide, please. So um, what, what is Kansas Health Foundation's approach, not only to digital um, equity and inclusion, um, but also as an organization as a whole? And I, I wanna share this graphic with you because um, prior to the departure of our, our president and CEO, we were undergoing a strategic planning process. And we, um, again, are in a season of transition. As you can see, we are on a winding road. Um, we are learning and unlearning together. Um, and we also recognize that we are not the experts, but that we really need to build um, community relationships and support those organizations that are. Um, and really let them be the driver. And, and that's a part of how we consider approaching um, this work and, and going forward. And so while we're in this time of transition, um, this initiative fits under our family support uh, and is identified in our 2022 policy priorities, um, where we're seeking to, to back those policies and 
and provide funding to strengthen childcare supports, um, educational needs, and remote learning and digital uh, connectivity to really expand um, economic opportunities for families. So um, how many of you, next slide. So how many of you went from this type of environment where you worked in, in an office collaborating with colleagues to this environment, um, next slide, where you are essentially working from home or you're primarily on Zoom, um, and you know, I'm, I'm guessing many hands would be raised. And although we've come back into, um, in many cases, working in offices again, um, the technology piece is still very critically important. Um, next slide, please. Um, many of us are living our, our lives online. Um, we're banking, we're shopping, we're working, um, and um, not necessarily in that order, but um, it's, it's critically important to be connected. Next slide, please. So um, some of us uh, even have, you know, apps on our phone that are monitoring our, our, our online usage. So we're on Snapchat, we're on Twitter, we're on iPhone, um, and or we're never far away from an internet connection. Next slide, please. But, you know, that's not the case for many regions across the state. Uh, many in Kansans, uh, many Kansans are really living in communities that have a digital divide without adequate access to either broadband or digital devices. And so um, the digital uh, impact we know can especially uh, impact low-income communities of color, um, rural areas, and other parts of the state when it comes to adoption rate. Next slide, please. So the legend on this map um, may be hard to see, but you can find these details in a report uh, prepared by Kansas Health Institute, variations in internet access across Kansas. And you can see these regions in black um, where up to 40% of the state uh, does not have uh, adequate broadband access. And there's a six-fold difference in the rate of inadequate internet access across regions in the state. Next slide, please. So um, here you can see that one in four Kansas children um, ages zero to 18 are living in um, households that lack in, a proper internet access, really making it difficult for remote learning. Um, also, uh, one quarter of non-elderly adults are also uh, living in households that lack adequate, adequate internet access. Next slide, please. Um, some Kansas we know are, are digitally disconnected. Uh, and for example, in Topeka, uh, up to 25% of the residents lack a, a, a device or a high-speed internet connection. And we know that there are also disparities in terms of um, access among Kansans by race. Uh, Kansans identifying as Black were 1.6 times more likely than whites to, to lack adequate internet access. And those identifying as Hispanic were 1.4 times more likely. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, um, the initiative itself, um, we know that broadband adoption and digital access and literacy is really necessary for today's job market. Um, and that low wages, low wage jobs are, are decreasing uh, with automation. Um, more than eight in 10 middle um, skill jobs require digital uh, literacy skills. And that we know also that um, digital literacy skills really provide a, a pathway um, to higher level skill jobs. And we know that multi-generational disadvantage requires multi-generational solutions. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned before, we are not the experts in this work, but we really view it as our job to support those organizations who've been working toward digital equity and inclusion. Um, and uh, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance uh, served as a sounding board in the early days as we developed the concept, and they offer practitioner support, policy awareness, and data and research to our funded partners. Uh, one of the um, next slide, please. Um, one of the practices that we consider uh, important, in addition to our focus on equity uh, at, at KHF, is really being a learning organization. So we engage charter company um, to really guide KHF and our funded partners in an equitable strategic learning approach for the initiative. Next slide, please. So having um, met with multiple stakeholders, many of you um, are, are on the call today, um, we developed an RFP uh, and KHF supported the launch of four collaboratives in August, 2021. 
And these collaboratives were charged with developing a strategic plan and a framework. Um, they were charged with educating community members about the disparities, um, thinking about the business case for greater adoption. And then um, for those federal uh, resources that are coming down the pike, um, making sure that consumers facing the greatest barriers would benefit. Next slide, please. So um, our funded partners leading these collaboratives include the city of Topeka, and they are utilizing com community digital navigators and technical navigator positions to help people really secure devices and point them to affordable internet services. And you'll be hearing from them shortly. Next slide, please. Um, with Groundwork Northeast Revitalization Group, they have launched a hotspot library uh, and a digital equity task force. And the team is also working towards an actionable countywide digital equity plan with the unified government. Next slide, please. Um, the University of Kansas Center for Research is offering technology uh, education for women transitioning from incarceration. Uh, and so supporting technical access and skills among women, we know is very important as they're transitioning out because the vast majority of, of these women are low income or from racial um, and ethnic minority groups. And about 60% of the imprisoned women have at least one child under the age of 18, which really makes it more essential for them to be able to um, not only support themselves, but their families. And so uh, this, this group is working on reentry technology workshops at correctional facilities um, and looking at uh, systematic ways to um, provide digital um, access and skills and thinking also about um, ways to make it such that inmates that are being released from correctional facilities when in a year um, have more access to, to digital literacy. Next slide, please. And then of course, last but not least, Casey Digital Drive is um, building a collaborative network of community uh, benefit organizations and other stakeholders to uh, develop projects, um, programs, and advocacy efforts um, for those who lack digital access in Wyandotte and Johnson County. Next slide, please. Well, you know, we know we all rely on being um, connected and, um, and that when we remove the barriers uh, to health like poverty, discrimination, um, and promote access to um, health care and good jobs and quality education and housing, that's when all people can reach their highest levels. And we believe that digital literacy and access plays a critical role in supporting communities of opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, and here you have my contact information for any questions or if you want to talk offline. And so with that, I would um, like to turn it over to uh, the Topeka team to tell you more about their efforts. I'm going to Sean. give people just a sec to yeah. record her um, contact information in case they want it. And, and Sean, I'll... let me just say um, two things. That was a very, very strong presentation. And I know you've already shared your slides with Leslie. Would it be okay if anyone requested um, for Leslie to be able to share those slides out? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's Thank some fabulous so information. Yeah, that's great. And, and thank you for all you're doing. This is a great, um, I mean, I mentioned it when I saw you last, but um, I think the intersection of health and digital equity is just can't be overstated. So thank you so much for your support. Oh, you're quite welcome. And thank you all for all that your organization is doing. Um, and we, we really appreciate the, the work and the effort that you're putting forth and it, it's paying dividends. Well, uh, that was a real treat to hear from you. And it really set the table nicely uh, for the three speakers we're about to hear from to, to give us more details about what's happening in Topeka. And um, uh, I'm just so, so proud and thrilled to be able to introduce Lazone Grays as our first speaker uh, to share more uh, kind of a, some of the outputs of some of the great strategic work that Sean shared. But, but what you need to know about Lazone, if you don't already, I mean, this guy's been working on these issues for uh, several decades, certainly when it comes to workforce development issues and social determinants of health. And uh, when it comes to digital 
inclusion specific. I know for the, at least the last 10 or 15 years, it's been really in the crosshairs of everything that uh, Lazone has been doing. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'm not going to say anything further other than to introduce you all to Lazone Grace, who's the uh, president and CEO of ISBA in um, IBSA in Topeka. And, uh, and Lazone, please share with us um, uh, this amazing breakthrough opportunity that's, that's starting to take place in T Topeka. Well, thank you, Tom. Can everyone hear me? Okay, excellent. I'm not going to be uh, long because I have a team here that has more amazing information and what they bring to the table is really stronger than me. I may have been a voice for a while, but it does take a team. And I see a lot of familiar faces here who I consider have been uh, gurus and counselors to me that helped me learn over the years. I've looked to Kansas City for a lot of leadership ever since Google Fiber came into town. And I have been able to learn from Rick and Jeremy and Rachel and uh, uh, Ron Green, Carrie. I've learned from so many people there that I want to be able to take what I learned and bring it here. So uh, it may have taken a while, but Topeka in Kansas has been talking about the digital divide for some time. I was a part of the uh, inter, there was a state committee from the Department of Commerce that was studying this and there was a study that came out and then our own city of Topeka did a study and I put the dates there in the, uh, that's in the presentation so a person can see how far back they go. I've always been um, very interested and in support of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance because it has provided a great framework and structure for me to think things through. Advocacy on this issue 20 years ago was not easy, even though the digital divide was clear. And it is because of the pandemic that some of the things that had been ignored years ago, it was forced to the forefront. And that brought us into the circle of other interested individuals, especially even uh, elected officials, which uh, someone on our team here will mention and share later that brought us together. And because I had been sort of a, a, a silent member to the Kansas City Digital Inclusion Coalition, checking in on the meetings, seeing how the flow of things going, being envious that we didn't have a coalition here that was as, as active. But uh, nevertheless, here we are. And we have, uh, uh, because of the actions through our city council member and others, we do have a strong team now. We are, are our coalition. And I'm, I'm glad that they are able to be here and see how your flow is going. We would really like to, I would love to see us be just as strong and cohesive as you all. And I, I firmly believe we're going to make it to that point. And so my part of the presentation was really just sort of speaking to the community work that led to our TSC Get Digital Coalition. Uh, I've shared here, you know, that I don't want people to think that it is something that we popped up and it is new and that we're just reacting to it. In reality, it is just time has given us all the strength and wings to fly higher and do better. And so this opportunity that the Kansas Health uh, Foundation provided us really just sort of put, gave us the opportunity of fitting all the other parts into a box. And now people are coming to the dead together and we're placing those places in that box in their proper place. And I fully believe that over the next several years of this grant here, we're gonna be doing some amazing things we have. You will learn from the other members here that we have, the anchor institutions and the important people that we need at the table right now. We have done some things that are very impressive, I believe, and that is inspiring other people who are interested in what we are doing. And so I'm glad it wasn't a one-year grant, that it's something that's going to be supported over the years. And, you know, uh, I would like to get that slide from Sean. <laughs> because that's the type of information that I love seeing and we can share with our team because just because we had a, a e-cycle drive, 
doesn't mean that we're done. There's some heavy lifting to go. We've got some team members that's ready to do it. And uh, I'm just very happy. And I wanna thank you for allowing me to uh, speak here at the coalition meeting. And I'm just gonna pass it on to, I believe, Scott. Thank you, Lazone. Uh, Lazone has been working on this for quite some time and, and make no mistake about it. Um, the voice behind the action has been Lazone. Um, in, in every respect, um, Lazone has championed this cause. Um, I, I came to Topeka at the end of that Tilson report in 2018. And, uh, and I too got to see you know, some high energy at the table and then uh, discovered that we were kind of all working in separate directions. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we all kind of came together, but I want to give you a kind of the breakdown of our uh, uh, Topeka Shawnee County Get Digital Coalition. Um, uh, our work is uh, conducted through the city of Topeka. Uh, Monique is our, is our uh, manager of the division that manages this project for us. Um, Shawnee County participates in our coalition. Topeka Public Schools, Topeka and Shawnee County uh, Library, uh, the Greater Topeka Partnership, ISB, uh, IBSA, the Jayhawk Area a Agency on Aging, Topeka Housing Authority, Housing and Credit Counseling, and the Community Resource Council, and then of course, Ann Ma from the Kansas Board of Education. Again, as Lazone said, we think we got the right players at the table now. We think we've got, uh, uh, we know our low to moderate income neighborhoods, uh, we know that they're represented in, in our matrix of people that we offer. Uh, we know that our schools are participating in this effort. And, um, and so I think we got the, the right mix of leaders at the table. And so it's a question now of making sure we get the resources in place and then get the action underway. And that's kind of where we find ourselves today. Uh, prior to the pandemic, many of us as individual entities were addressing digital equity um, in our on-site situations. Uh, Topeka Public Schools had a one-to-one -one initiative where our elementary students uh, kept their device at the school and our middle and high school students were able to take their devices home. Um, but all the connectivity that we knew they had uh, was at the school. And so uh, there were homes that had connectivity at home and there were homes that did not have connectivity at home. and um, and that's essentially the, the digital divide. And so uh, we worked through that by providing offline alternatives whenever there were activities to engage in online, um, or we made assignments not mandatory, but that doesn't really solve the problem because the people who are able to participate in the online assignments from home had an advantage and had, an, had a learning advantage over the students who were not able to do so. And even with offline alternatives, it didn't quite, doesn't quite fill in that gap. Um, Shawnee County Library similarly had, uh, had labs and training services that they can, that they prior to the pandemic continued to provide. Um, they had resources available for checkout for families who did not have those resources available in the home. And these efforts were being made by all of our individual constitu constituent entities um, and, and they were good efforts for, for what we were trying to do, but they didn't quite fill the void. And, and as, uh, as Sean said, it's a multi-generational issue. If you've got students who are learning in the home without that digital access, they grow up, they don't have the access to the opportunity that the students who did have. And so as a result of that, they, they, that continues and it's multi-generational. Uh, the pandemic caused us to have to think outside the box. Um, as employers, we're sending people home to work from home. As school districts, we're sending people home to learn from, learn from home. Uh, we needed alternatives. We needed to figure this out. And so one of the things that Topeka Public Schools did early uh, is not only did we send the one-to-one -one devices home, but we said, okay, we need, to, we need to make sure that we find a way for them to get connected. Um, Cox is our internet provider for the school district. So we reached out to them and said, hey, what would it take for us to be able to provide the internet for a family that doesn't have it? And so um, Cox had done a great job of offering uh, a discounted service to, uh, to families, but not all families qualified. Not all families had the uh, credit history or the relationship with vendors uh, to be able to secure the, that service, even at $10 a month. And so 
I ask the question, can, can we pay that $10 a month? Um, you know, can we do that for our families so that we can make sure that they get connected? There were some bugs to work out, but we, we made that partnership happen. Uh, we secured uh, a grant to be able to make that, uh, to be able to make that a reality. And so I forget the exact number, but it's in the neighborhood of 3,000 of our families um, have an internet service being paid for by the district through grant funds that we've received through various opportunities. And initially, that was only going to be for the 2000, uh, actually it was initially only going to be till December 31st of 2000. Uh, but through some extensions and some additional grants, uh, we're still doing it. And so uh, we're, we're we're still committed to the idea that these homes need and deserve internet and that the only way we're gonna conquer the digital divide is to eliminate it. And so, so that's the first step that we put into place. And again, uh, Topeka Shawnee County Public Library also reached out to similar grant opportunities through E-Rate and uh, they provided some, some devices, some additional devices available for checkout and some additional hotspots available for checkout. And again, all of us were doing these things to get through the pandemic but we all realized that there, we were all working in different ways towards the same objective. Um, and then we had a meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee in which uh, I was invited to explain what Topeka Public Schools is doing. Uh, I was asked some challenging questions. Is it good enough? How do we know it's working? Um, where do we need more access to resources and what can we do better? And those are all challenging questions, but we, we took them in stride and we realized that there's still a lot left to do. We can put an internet connection in the home. We can get a device home with the student, but that doesn't mean that the learning is happening. That doesn't mean that it's successful. Um, so there were some additional things that we explored. And in the, in the context of that conversation, uh, we learned something collaboratively as a group. And that was access for us wasn't the issue. It wasn't whether or not um, a service was available to a client family. It was whether or not the family was in the position to be able to to be able to use that service. It was whether or not the family had the resources to be able to choose that service, and whether or not they had the skills to be able to make that service work on their behalf. And so that's the things that we started exploring uh, together as a team. After that meeting, um, Councilman Neil Dobler reached out to several voices, uh, Lazone being one of them. Uh, to kind of let's look at this a little bit more in depth. Let's analyze this more deeply and determine what it is that is A, causing people not to have the access to, that we know is in our city. B, what is causing people maybe not to be able to use that access in the same way as others who have been using it for generations. And so those, those are the things that we started to kind of take in, into account and we started working towards a strategic uh, solution. As a team, we adopted four pillars right off the bat, affordable equitable access, affordable devices, digital literacy, citizenship and support. And then our fourth one was funding and sustainability because we realized the pandemic was temporary. Well, we hope it's temporary. Uh, we realized that whatever we do, we need to make sure this never happens again. We need to make sure that, that the, the, play, the playing field is legitimately leveled and that we're picking up uh, for all that lost time. And I say lost time with a smile for Lazone because man, he's been, he's been working this effort for a long time and we've got a lot of time to make up for. Um, and then finally, uh, we recommended an administrative policy uh, to the city of Topeka, which was adopted. And uh, Shawnee County is looking at a similar uh, administrative policy. And then each of our constituent groups has been asked to, uh, um, to produce and uh, enact a statement of agreement or a statement of uh, action uh, in regard to promoting digital equity and digital inclusion. And then our, our final phase of, of our early development was to draft the digital inclusion handbook. Uh, well, this is where we captured the thoughts that we were having, the, the goals, the vision, the mission, the strategic plan, the whole piece of it together and uh, provide these resources for not only our staff that we that we're working with and our digital navigators and technical navigators, but also for members of the community that want to participate with us. So uh, again, we continue to operate as a coalition. Uh, we believe that is the right mix for us. Um, as individual entities, we're pursuing things that are uh, working towards that common goal. 
Um, and as a coalition, we're also pursuing things that, uh, that the coalition together can support towards that common goal. Um, Topeka Public Schools, we didn't stop there. Uh, we've worked with the Kansas Broadband Office um, to, uh, to pursue additional grant opportunities, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which is uh, administered through E-Rate, and we sought uh, Sparks funds to be able to work, as we put it, we're working on that younger generation. We're working on trying to get everything that we can into the hands of our students and families and make sure that we close the gap from that angle. And then um, as a coalition, we've started from the other side of the, uh, of the spectrum. We're gonna start with our older citizens and older neighbors in these low to moderate income neighborhoods. And we're going to work with them first uh, to make sure that they get the opportunity to get connected while the school district's working on the other side. We're gonna meet in the middle and we're gonna be working so that we get every household connected and not just connected, every household able to use the device and able to use the connection for their economic and multi-generational advantage because that's what it's gonna to take to succeed. And when we do that, Topeka is going to be a landmark um, for this effort and, and that's, that's our goal. Um, at this point, I believe that was my last slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Monique. Thanks, Scott. Greetings, everyone. So I will be um, very quick, and let me apologize in advance. Um, we have received 378 phone calls in the last 24 hours um, pertaining to our 60 plus uh, program, and I'm, I don't want my navigators to run out of the door and not come back. So I will be very brief and then go and assist them in this effort. And so um, I will share with you how we are, are being very intentional on how we connect with our neighbors to ensure that they have digital access. Um, as my cohort spoke earlier, we decided to utilize the digital navigator format. And with that, uh, I was able to acquire a part-time community digital navigator and a technical navigator. And they both started, one started in November and the other started and joined us in December. And so they have been taking trainings, um, looking to seeing what other uh, cities are doing and trying to really see how we could stop to mold what's best for our community. And they've done a great job with that. Beyond the basic technical and um, normal skill sets that you would utilize in an employer want with an employee, it was imperative that we found navigators that would be able to provide first class customer experiences for our neighbors, as well as knowing how important it is that they would really be empowering people's lives, being able to connect them with devices and having internet access really will change the lives of some of our neighbors who otherwise would never have these opportunities. Um, again, as Scott Lazone alluded to earlier, we really have taken a lot of time to try to find out that we have the right partners at the table of the coalition. It is imperative here uh, in Topeka, we have 160,000 people during the day um, that are in Topeka and, and when others leave after five o'clock, it goes down to our population of 126,000. And it's really imperative for us to take into account that a trust factor and relationships are essential. People trust certain leaders in the community and what they say, uh, they believe exactly in what they say. And so it was important for us to have those partners at the table to help to be advocates for the program. We uh, were able to work with PCs for People is one of our biggest partners, and not just because Tom is on the call with us, but um, his team has been fantabulous in helping us to get up and going on the program. And one thing that we really needed to make sure that we had were devices. It's great to talk about it. It's great to talk about looking for funding, but you have to have the devices to be able to make a difference in the program. So we're very appreciative of their efforts to assist us. But we also knew as we got a little closer to our first event that we needed to have an e-cycle. This isn't the first e-cycle event that Topeka's had. This is our fifth one. But this one, we were very intentional on the devices that we wanted to accept. And so on April the 16th, it was extremely cold. Um, and the teams were out there and we were there from eight to one and we were able to receive a little bit over 1700 devices to be able to ensure most of those were tablets, but we were excited to have our Topeka neighbors come out. Um, we received probably about 10 or 11 practically new um, computers at that time as well. And people really were just um, happy to know about the initiative and that their device would be able to help someone else who potentially wouldn't be able to have a device. So we're extremely ecstatic in regards to that. Our other partner, Jayhawk Area Agency on Aging, utilized some of their um, ARPA funds and provided us a $140,000 donation to the, to the coalition. And with that, 120,000 of it will yield 1,200 desktop computers for seniors over 60 that qualify. And then the remaining $20,000 will be utilized for those same seniors for internet access. 
Um, with that being said, we did some marketing two days ago and voila, the phone is ringing off the hook. We have these 60 plus neighbors who are ecstatic about it, listening to some of the voicemails. I'm almost coming to tears listening to them saying they never thought they'd be able to get a computer and call back whenever you can, but we're just excited. What do I need to do to get it? It's just extremely exciting um, to know that uh, we have already reached up 300 and some that have called us. We do know, thinking, uh, thanks to the reference that Sean made earlier, that 30,976 of our Topeka neighbors are LMI neighbors. And so within that, knowing that we've had 360 of them already call us, um, we are just excited to know that the word is getting out. Another thing that um, I wanted to make sure to share is that we're really using a grassroots approach. Uh, thinking about which target we are trying to reach, de depending on which um, model we're using, and I'm only speaking of our 60 plus initiative, um, social media is great, but not for this target market. Um, we know that their neighbors, their children, their grandchildren will share with them what they saw on social media, but that's not really what this group um, utilizes for the information and the information that they trust, which is actually vitally important. So we are erecting standing banners. Those standing banners are cost effective and yield thousands of impressions that we would never be able to touch these people. And so um, these neighbors will be able to see these standing banners in government buildings and senior housing buildings at the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library and at senior centers. We also will be distributing posters to our other social service agencies and asking them to share that information with their clientele as well. Infographics are being provided in Meals on Wheels, um, meals that are being distributed, and we will have those posted around as well. And then we're asking the city manager, the mayor, and some of our governing body members members to do some really quick videos and those will be shared on social media and without throughout the mainstream media as well and again uh, continuing on with those relationships that we have with social service agencies and asking them to share the information share with their clientele that it's trusted um, this is not a scam and that they will um, you know be able to get a, a device if they qualify and then having our uh, partner Susan Harris, who's the executive director of Jayhawk Air and Agency, really being the voice for this um, component um, of the initiative has been outstanding. And I know that their phone's ringing off the hook as well. So we are excited about the opportunity. Very appreciative to KHF for allowing us the opportunity to be able to um, address this initiative in a way that in which we can touch thousands of lives and to be able to um, assist our neighbors in having some connectivity. And with that being said, finally, I'll share that there will be some digital training. The goal is that we will distribute the devices in, in June, July, and August. We will begin to offer digital training and computer training with both the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library and our technical navigator in July. And we'll continue to offer multiple classes from July through December and then starting again in January. Thank you. Monique, it's such an exciting model and I'm so glad that you all were able to share this. Um, I know my team has just absolutely loved uh, the starting process of working with you all. That uh, collection event was just um, a resounding success. Uh, we've had some nice visits with both your digital navigator and your technical navigator over the last week. Um, uh, and, 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 and hopefully all of you who are on this call and, and have had a chance to listen to Lazone and Scott and Monique uh, can see what a splendid example it is of uh, and, and kind of the early outcomes of some of the work that Sean was uh, presenting in her magnificent presentation. Um, I just think this has just been one of the most exciting package presentations we've had on the coalition call for some time. And I'm really excited to, to be part of it as a participant, but also um, to share with those of you on the call. We've got a hand up, Leslie, um, who, uh, Leslie, Leslie Scott, who along with Wendy Pearson, by the way, they have been managing all the behind the scenes of setting up this meeting. I'm so appreciative to them. Uh, Leslie, you got your hand raised for a comment. Yeah, uh, I'm a former Topeka resident, grew up there. But we had a, a Topeka address, but never lived in the city limits. And I noticed that there's a limitation for those um, computers to be living in the city limits. And so I'm wondering if you're working with um, Shawnee County and then also, um, you know, the surrounding counties have a lot of poor, um, very small towns um, and 
you know, uh, we all had to go to town uh, to shop. And so, you know, Topeka is the, um, you know, the place where we all would go for um, groceries and, and other things. So it's, it's definitely a relationship there. So just curious as to how you're sort of handling that. I'll go ahead and speak to that uh, to that point. We've been intentional, including the county in, in, in this coalition. Uh, we recognize that the concentrations of low to moderate income families um, are located within uh, neighborhoods within Topeka. And so uh, recognizing that digital adoption um, risks against digital adoption um, occur in a higher concentration in these environments. And so, uh, so we're starting there. We have been intentional, including the county. Um, the county has been a, a, a strong partner in this. Um, it will take more effort and more partnerships for us to be successful in expanding beyond the, uh, our current uh, our current environment within the city of Topeka. But we are we are absolutely intentional about continuing that effort and attracting those partnerships after we can show them what can be accomplished. And um, and I think that that. You know, I, I don't anticipate us having having every Topeka household connected before branching out to the county. I expect that once we get this initiative going with our uh, over 60 population, I expect that the county uh, will form some you know additional partnerships and we'll be able to branch off into that direction as well. And one one other quick quick question: Who who receives the um, the funding for the coalition? Who holds that money? So the funding for the coalition that we receive from the Kansas Health Foundation is held by the city of Topeka uh, and is being spent through through that through their processes. Um, our digital navigator um, and our uh, technical navigator are both currently half-time employees uh, uh, with the city of Topeka. And um, as we expand that with uh, additional um, funds and grants and and allocations, as we expand that initiative. Um, th that will continue to be operated through the city um, for, for our operating arm. But our coalition um, also uh, is currently setting up an arrangement uh, with the CRC, Con Community Resource Council, I believe, um, in, in which we'll be able to accept donations and stuff as a coalition and be able to uh, earmark those funds as a coalition uh, uh, through that. So again, Scott, are, are you uh, so are you setting up the coalition as its own 501c3 or uh, you know as a legal at, entity? At present, we are not. Um, okay. We we do believe um, that that could be an outcome down the road, but at present, we believe the uh, the energy, the the partnership uh, that we have as a team of leaders um, is is really worth more to us right now than an organizational structure would be. Now, admittedly, all of us that are actively engaged in, in, in these activities recognize that that will grow way beyond our capacity to be able to, to collaboratively lead. Um, but at some, so at some point down the road, I think that's inevitable. But for, for what we're doing now, I think that it's way more valuable for us to continue as a consortium of leaders. Well, I appreciate that perspective. That very much characterizes how we've operated as the Kansas City Coalition. Um, you know, because of the recent, um, you know, groundswell of federal and, and what will be state funding, I think there's there is some argument that that maybe we would be better served as a, a you know a, a fully functioning. Body, but on the other hand, those of us who have been actively working together are the very practitioners that are, you know, utilizing those funds. So it would have to be through, you know, a completely objective kind of oversight body. And so, as you said, our energies right now are much better spent just continuing to gather together as leaders of various practitioner organizations and. Uh, I, I noticed Sherry Gonzalez is on the calls and, and others who are working on behalf of kind of presenting a um, kind of a unified picture of the Kansas City, the greater Kansas City region. Um, and, you know, that is, um, a, again, it's a it's a challenge 
for us to do um, without, you know, a more formally structured uh, entity as the coalition. But on the other hand, it gets even more challenging if those of us who are members of the coalition are the ones who are actually in line to utilize that funding to do the, the service work. So hopefully um, we'll continue on this parallel plane um, and the momentum is, uh, is obvious. Um, and, and the fact that you're taking that momentum uh, and as evidenced by uh, what Monique just presented to us, I mean, uh, you're really executing and, and you're getting things done. You've got, you know, you've got foot soldiers who are out there making things happen and we're proud to be part of that. And uh, I hope others on the call can, can see and, and share our excitement and our inspiration uh, for what can happen, uh, especially when you have someone as dedicated as Lazone has been and persistent. Um, uh, and like he said, you know, so many of us feel grateful that we're kind of in the right place at the right time. Um, but it's, you know, the, the last thing we can afford to do uh, is, um, you know, uh, indicate that for some reason this issue is going away. And the work begins now, as you've all been saying. And and we know we're, we've been rolling up our sleeves. We're fortunate to have a lot of resources coming uh, to the table, but um, but now's where, now is is when the work really starts. And uh, I was just very inspired by uh, by all the presentations this morning. And I'd like to ask anyone else on the call if if you haven't raised your hand or if you'd like to jump in to make uh, a comment or if you have a question um, for for either Sean. Uh, um, or, you know, our three speakers from Topeka, uh, Lazone, Scott, and Monique. A any other comments or questions? I do want to give a shout out to um, uh, our steering council member, Carrie Coogan. She is a uh, board member on the NDIA. And Sean, uh, I was uh, just delighted with so many aspects of what you presented in your material, but uh, to hear how helpful that the NDIA has been. Uh, and it's certainly been uh, just a, a powerful guiding force. I know Lazone, you mentioned them as well. Um, Carrie, I don't know if, um, if you had any additional comments relative to the um, just explosive growth that the NDIA has had and the degree to which uh, the kinds of things we heard uh, this morning that's happening in Kansas and in Topeka in particular reflect um, some of the strategic priorities of the NDIA. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom, and, and thanks again. I, I echo what you said about the presentations. They're amazing, and the work that Lizone has been doing is incredible. Um, I would just say that, I, I mean, I think we all know that the National Digital Inclusion Alliance has been a great resource. In fact, uh, they had uh, an initial conference here in Kansas City, and that was the very beginnings of NDIA, was here in Kansas City. Um, I don't know, probably six years ago, many of you probably participated in that summit. Um, and so I think Kansas City plays a pivotal role in, in the beginnings of NDIA uh, To, um, But I just would want to continue to offer them to anybody on this call or anybody who's doing this work as a resource. And if you go to their website, there's they follow a lot of the legislation that we're looking at. They have a lot of uh, guidebooks and handbooks and, and just a wealth of information for people who are just beginning this work um, and those of us who have been in it for a long time. So just offering it up again as a, as a continued great resource. And, and really they listen to all of us. They listen to the affiliates. They listen to the people doing the work. And I think that's what's really important. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Well, I'm gonna um, take us back to our agenda real quick. Um, and so that you can see where we've, uh, we've gotten through so far. And I haven't, been able to see if anyone from the HEDC has Maricela joined. Maricela is on, Tom. Oh, good. Yeah. So, Maricela, um, we missed you earlier, but we are committed to giving you and the HEDC a chance to share some highlights with the group. So, over to you. Well, yes, I, I just want to say really quickly, Maricela was late only because we didn't give her the correct Zoom link, so it was totally not her fault. Yes, hi, I apologize for being late, um, but here I am, better late than never. <laughs> great, great seeing all you guys today. So yes, I'm excited to um, inform you guys a little bit of what we are doing here at HEDC. 
And we have a few things, so let me go ahead and get that going. We have a few um, new things we're working on as well. So very exciting. We actually yesterday um, launched our podcast that we had been working on. One second. Technical difficulty to begin with. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. Okay, I'll just go over it with you guys. Um, not, I don't know why my presentation is not playing. So we have the Hispanic Economic Development Corporation. HEDC is dedicated to improving the lives of Latinos within the greater Kansas City area. We achieve this through business development and economic and community wealth creation initiatives. We serve the Latinx community in the greater Kansas City area and beyond. And about our programs, we have the Impacto Fund. HEDC provides one-on-one -on -one technical assistance by appointment to current and inspiring entrepreneurs needing our help with starting and sustaining or growing a business. HEDC provides computer training and adult education through centralized English and Spanish training curriculums. Classes are offered in three levels, beginning, intermediate, and advanced. And also we have then in digital address, um, digital inclusion and equity, that's a new product. And um, why do we join the coalition? Um, well, HEDC supports the initiatives that promote digital equity and inclusion in less served communities. Digital Inclusion KC is a space that motivates and encourages the participation and collaboration of all communities in the Kansas City metro area. Um, and Digital Inclusion KC is a space where inclusion digital initiatives are promoted and works against the inclusion and digital equity illusion. So um, how can we, how can coalition members help? Um, basically by promoting our digital literacy bilingual programs and including and helping us reach out to the Latinx and immigrant communities. I feel like people are eager to learn. They just um, need the right sources and um, know they are especially with the people that I get to work with they they're actually excited they want to learn they want to be included you know they don't want to be left out especially right now everything this past couple years everything has changed everything is basically digital Yeah, thank you. That's uh, pretty much what we have um, here to offer. And we look forward to maybe um, starting, you know, work on our modules, on other modules to go ahead and help people get to where they want to be. Excellent. Thanks so much, Maricela. Are there any questions for Maricela or comments? Um, any additional highlights of, of things that um, anyone's been working on with the ATDC, um, just feel free to jump in. And if not, I thank you again, Marcella, for presenting that. It's, um, it's great guys. to get the update. And like I said, Gabrielle is 
always on these calls and uh he was uh, he was pleased uh, that that you were able to to step in and share those highlights with us this morning. So thanks oh, again. Yes. Thank you. So what I'd like to do now, we only have um, a short bit of time left, uh, about 15, 20 minutes, um, and I want to make sure that um, that all of you are aware that we dedicate time during each monthly meeting to share some community announcements. Um, we uh, particularly want to highlight right now across the country, uh, raising awareness of uh, the opportunity to enroll in the Affordable Connectivity Plan. The ACP um, is taking uh, a lot of energy and, and effort uh, through flyers and outreach activities. Um, I know KC Digital Drive and the Kansas City Public Library uh, represented here on the meeting uh, by Leslie Scott, uh, Wendy Pearson, Carrie Coogan, and others, um, as well as uh, the work we do with PCs for People, um, uh, Ina Montgomery, uh, uh, steering council member, and the work she's doing with the school, uh, Kansas City Public Schools, and others. Um, I mean, we're, we're all spending a, a lot of time and energy making sure people are aware of this. Um, so please, Please let us know if you need help. We've got flyers we can provide in digital form to any of you. Um, uh, Tom, um, yeah. can we go back to the ACP outreach? I think Sherry needs to go. So if we could give her just a couple minutes, um, I actually have some, some relevant things to say about ACP, um, which sure. is right on the agenda. So um, go ahead. Sherry, you wanna go ahead? Thanks, Leslie. Um, I know I'm the bottom one. I'm trying, I have, I have another meeting, so I'm trying to hang on <laughs> so we can just share a little bit. Thank you um, for, for having us, for sort of um, really the work that all of you have been doing for years in this space, you know, as demonstrated by the commitment to this group and so many others in Kansas City. We, we know that there, you know, we benefit from the collaboration and the work of so many in digital equity. Um, as you know, you mentioned, Tom, we are trying to really get ourselves organized in a bi-state regional sort of equity plan, uh, responding to this sense of urgency that there's funding all over the place, local, state, federal, philanthropic dollars, um, three regional organizations have been working together to sort of advance an investable strategy toward that end goal of having all households connected. Um, these organizations are Mid-America Regional Council. Marlene was not able to, to stay <laughs> on the call. Um, and they really represent local governments across the two states. Uh, Casey Rising. Um, a business-led effort aimed at regional prosperity for all in the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank with background and expertise on this issue and community development engagement. So there was an initial assessment that was qualitative and quantitative data. I believe that Mike Heckman presented to this group some of the qualitative data um, that they had done it should reflect the conversations that you were all having. Some of the things we just heard, right? That this is multi-pronged, that it isn't just broadband, it's that plus skills, plus devices, <laughs> plus sort of sustainable strategies and organizations. Um, so, so that does reflect the conversations. What we also tried to do is pull quantitative data. And so some of that data is also in a final report. For instance, 73.5% of area households have broadband service. We can break that down by where, right? There's significant disparities in our urban neighborhoods and our rural communities. And at Casey Rising, we then also compare our metrics to benchmark cities, there's 10 of them. And that percentage that we have actually ranks us at 10, which is not a good place to be, <laughs> right? And so, so there's a story there to tell about how there's still work yet to be done. Um, our next steps are that that full report that I mentioned will be available sometime in July to the general public. We will share an early release draft with this group and others that are working in this space. Um, we are also working with an engineering firm to identify the gaps in infrastructure. 
Where is there still fiber yet to be laid? What are the speeds in different parts of town? Uh, what about plans that are available uh, by geography? The work did begin just this month. Um, we expect results within 60 days, which would then inform a larger strategy. Um, at the same time that that work is ongoing with the engineering firm, a small group is beginning to look at an RFP for consultants. We don't think any one entity is probably going to do the full thing, right? But for consultants to support the development of a regional digital equity strategic investment plan, um, the plan will provide ultimately some discrete actions that we can all take together in order to secure that available funding that is there. Um, and it is, again, going to take all of us because there's also quite a bit of cost share that's going to be required <laughs> to even access those dollars. Um, there will be also some robust community and public engagement that's expected to be part of that planning effort. There are some immediate funds available to the nonprofit COVID relief fund. Um, a number of us are helping to advise that advisory board, which some of you are on for the debris for greatest impact. This is, this is an early opportunity uh, to start to move forward the plan. Um, as this work continues, I've mentioned it. It's Working you. together One, so at the seven, end, we nine. have the catalytic change we're hoping for toward that like ever better tomorrow for Kansas Cityans. So that's just a quick update on where we're at and at least the next steps that we know of of where we're going and a little bit about the timeline. That's great. Thanks so much, Sherry. Um, any questions for Sherry about those updates? Um, it's been a lot happening in a short period of time. Um, so really appreciate all the, the work you guys are doing at Casey Rising and this broader collaborative. So we have, uh, we have another community announcement um, from Rick Usher and Adrienne Haynes um, uh, having to do with a new development from the city of Kansas City, Missouri and their new emerging technology board. So Adrienne, if I'll hand over to you and you guys can give us an update. Thank you so much, Tom and co-host. It's great to be here at this meeting. And of course, thank you to my fellow board member, Rick Usher, for his leadership in this space as well. Rick, I can't see you on my camera, but please, if you uh, want to jump in, please do. Um, my name is Adrian sure. Haynes. I'm here as a community member and as the board chair for the City of Kansas City's Emerging Technology Board. This ordinance, this board was created by ordinance in late 2019. And then last year, we finally kind of formalized our board. So we've had a few quarterly meetings. And then this last weekend, we hosted a spring retreat, which some of you may have received an invite to participate. Um, and thank you. I see some faces on the call who I know have already submitted their information to be a part of our community working group. So that's really what I wanted to share about today and to extend the invite to all of you and any community members that you may know to really participate and to keep your voices top of mind for us and for the city as we really do what our ordinance has charged us to do, which was a three-part charge. So first, our job is to help foster a system of collaboration between city departments and agencies on specific and significant emerging technology decisions. Um, our job, secondly, is to provide city decision makers with well-informed advice on significant emerging technology decisions involving the city's use of technology, as well as use of technology by private entities and pri public-private partnerships. And then most importantly, and I think why this group is important to us, is to also, our third charge is to regularly engage stakeholders to inform that work. And so to do that, of course, we have an appointed board that Mayor Lucas put together. But then as a community, we're putting, as a board community, we're putting together a community working group to come to our board meetings, to attend our trainings, and to keep some of these technology issues that are relevant to the region, you know, in, in the conversation that we're having at the city level as well. Rick, I'll take a breath for you to jump in. Oh, Rick has been sure. part of the group since the beginning. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and uh, I mean, as a lot of you know, I was uh, pushing for this effort at the city um, when I was assistant city manager for 
small business and entrepreneurship, trying to find more ways to engage the city council and the community in conversations of uh, in, in emerging technology. What I had been looking at at the time were you know, Uber and Lyft and mobile apps that were inundating the city. And, and then you know, most recently, I think scooters. And, um, but through all of this, as we've discussed in this group, digital access, internet access for our residents is essential, especially for local government. You know, we're moving more of our services online to incre increase um, you know, community engagement. So I appreciate Adrian's uh, leadership on this. And uh, it was a bit ironic that um, two weeks after I retired, the mayor's office called and said, hey, we're gonna appoint folks to this board. And I was like, wow, let's do it. So uh, I'll, I'll continue to share uh, with this group, the agendas as they come out, and uh, we really, really are looking to increase participation in this. And uh, the the retreat that we had, Adrian, do we know? No pressure. When the videos will be available for that, we're talking about creating a YouTube channel. Uh, we have a YouTube channel for uh, this coalition where these videos will be posted. I saw some folks asking about that, but um, there were some really great presentations made there and. Uh, Professor Lapino at uh, UMKC uh, really helped pull that agenda together. Great point, Rick. So we have training as as required in our ordinance as well. And so we were able to host city staff to really let us know how they're using technology and opportunities for you know engagement and partnership, as well as to host experts from around the country who are watching Kansas City because we really are a leader in this space. And so um, just to close, if anybody's interested or wants to participate, we'd really love to have you at our meetings and to keep you know these meetings on our agenda as well. And if you need anything or have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or Rick. And Rick, the videos are ready. We just haven't posted them yet. So sure. if anybody's sure. interested in the materials from the retreat, we do have all the presentations, the full agenda, and the videos to be dropped probably next week. Happy to share. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Thanks, Adrienne, and thanks, Rick, for sharing. And um, uh, it's just a lot of exciting things happening uh, around the region. Uh, I want to um, just acknowledge we've got about five or six minutes left, and I actually want to turn to our wonderful behind-the-scenes um, uh, partners, both Leslie and Wendy, uh, to, to if you guys have anything that you want to make sure that we cover with respect to any newsletter items yeah, um, and I, I uh, do. other announcements. <laughs> yep, <laughs> so I raised my hand. Um, so as it relates to ACP outreach, um, I got about 12,000 flyers uh, from the FCC. So we have those at our office. Um, we are happy to deliver those to you to um, do any kind of outreach that you may be doing, even setting them out um, in your, your office, et cetera. You can contact me um, and I will arrange that offline. Um, in addition, we now have a member update signup form. So just like the HEDC did today, to let everybody know about um, what they have going on. If your organization would like to give a member update, we do have that sign up form. I believe it was in the newsletter, but we will continue to include that in the newsletter going forward so that um, you, know, you can raise your hand to do that. Um, and in that way, uh, we can schedule people going forward. So that's, um, that's what I have. Very good. Um, if there are no other announcements, I do wanna call your attention to the chat window. Ron Green uh, provide, provided a, a link to some exciting uh, STEM related activities happening in the area. Ron, I didn't know if you had any other um, amplification uh, comments you would wanna to add to that. No, I would just mention that there are over 100 events, uh, all of the major STEM related nonprofit and educational groups uh, around town are offering a wide range of STEM related, maker related workshops uh, for kids. So I look, uh, included the link on the calendar of events so you can easily find something that 
someone you know may find interesting. It's all sponsored by Casey STEM Alliance and the Bruce Foundation. Great program. It's our second year of offering this. So I think you'll find it interesting. Fabulous. Thank you, Ron. Anybody else with a final um, update announcement? Um, otherwise, I'm putting our final slide on uh, the screen, just sharing that our next meeting will be early in the month. The first Friday will come on June 3rd, uh, and we'll be sending out an agenda here in the next couple of weeks. So if there are not any other comments or uh, highlights, I'm trying to see if anybody else is raising their hand. Um, I would like to give you guys back at least two minutes of this meeting time. And thank you all for joining us. Um, if you're not planning to watch the Derby tomorrow, you know, that's okay. But uh, at least celebrate uh, the fact that uh, summer's almost here and uh, hopefully we'll uh, stop the rain that we've been having for the last week. Everybody enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, and let's keep the momentum going for digital inclusion. We really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.